All right, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is May the 7th, 2017. And I guess today is Neil Hobbs. Hey, Niels. Hey there, Hi, folks. Niels is the organizer of Necronomicon, the upcoming Lovecraft convention in Providence that's held every two years. So we'll talk to Niels in a second. Um, let's do introductions. But first, Matt has a prize, I believe. Yes, I do, and it's a great one. You know they they um, published the nominations for the Shirley Jackson Awards, which is really one of the uh, defining honors of our genre. And I have a copy of one of the most unique, wonderful anthologies to come out in a number of years. It is a hardcover copy, The Madness of Dr. Caligari. Um, it is edited by none other than Joe Pulver. Since he lives in Germany, I just faked his signature. Oh, good. Anyway. So that's well, we'll tell everybody how to win that later on in the show, as usual. I, I, uh, I will, I will send whoever wins it, if they want, I'll send them a handwritten note with my signature to put in the book. On an app. I, I want it, Joe. You get nothing, Carpenter. <laughs> wow, he's giving away your book. You're being mean to him, poor guy. No, no. Well, I always pick on him. I gotta pick on him. He'll feel weird if I don't pick on him. All right. Well, let's start with SP and work our way over with introductions. Hi, I'm SP Miskowski, and I write fiction. And Rick. Rick, Rick Lay, writer. Pete. Uh, Pete Rollick, Hyundai owner. Yours was four words and Rick was Rick's was three. So I don't think you can get any shorter than three unless you just say your name and then it's not really an introduction. <laughs> Matt. Hi, I'm Matt Carpenter. I don't write fiction. I tell the awful truth as it is. And you are a editor once in a while? Yeah, if you want to call it that. Yeah, you're editing books. I mean, yeah, we're we're doing we're still working on Pickman's gallery, so it's it's slowly happening. Um, Joe, Joe Polver, writer, editor, and this guy here, Benjamin Handelman, uh, is one of my Patreon donors. So he gives at the level where you get to be on the show once a month. So if you if you want that particular torture you too can join Ben's ranks, although there is a limit on how many people can, can do this. So, so hey, say, introduce yourself real quick, Ben. I'm Ben, a uh, longtime fan, uh, especially of Joe Pulver there. I'm a, Thank uh, you. Isn't that nice? It is, yeah. As, I remember as, as he's joined now, does that mean we pick on him too, Mike? Obviously. Yeah, that's fine. Nobody can pay enough money to not get picked on. <laughs> uh, I remember reading Night of the Seven back in the 90s, so... Reading what? Uh, Nightmare's Disciple. Oh, uh, yeah. Chaosium put it out. And so, Mike Davis put it out, the recent print version. Uh, yeah, another out. print version, and now all the Kindle owners out there can have a copy for their, for their Kindles. Uh, the Kindle being the so. important thing. I have uh, way too much Lovecraftian work on my Kindle right now. <laughs> it's a Lovecraftian uh, police procedural. Yeah. So. So, Niels, uh, why don't you introduce yourself, and then let's talk about the upcoming Lovecraft Convention in Providence. Great. Okay. Uh, so, my name is Niels Hobbs. I am the director of the Lovecraft Arts and Sciences Council, which is an organization, a nonprofit organization based here in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, we sometimes bill ourselves as the birthplace of weird. And uh, now going on to our third iteration of the Necronomicon Providence. Uh, convention that is essentially um, the largest gathering of weird fiction aficionados, Lovecraftian fans, authors, uh, academics, artists, etc. Uh, and that's coming up this August, August 17th to the 20th. Uh, and so we're ramping up very quickly in our plans to get that uh, off the ground and another amazing experience for attendees. Just real quick, Niels, what do you do when you're not doing this? Because it's very, you have one of my dream jobs. 
um, uh, I, I uh, what's the what's the quick way to describe it? I'm a marine biologist essentially, and currently I'm just finishing up a really grueling uh, teaching load, um, teaching at a few different universities around New England, um, and I'm starting a, a research fellowship um, with the Department of Energy um, as of two weeks from now, basically um, working with the EPA as long as it lasts. Um, to uh, to study uh, the effects of ocean acidification on marine invertebrates. Pretty cool. Stuff. Well, yeah. What do you want to talk about in regards to Necronomicon first? Um, so, I mean, I, I think, you know, it's probably been a long time. I'm not even sure. I can't even recall the last time I was on the show. So It's been quite a while, yeah. Yeah, it's been a while. Um, I, I don't really think we said much about it last time. I think we right. were just maybe making people aware of the fact that it was yeah. coming in the not too distant future, you know? Yeah, honestly, it might even have been um, last summer when we were talking about the film festival um, that we, you know, partner up with Brian and Gwen at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival in Portland. Um, they come over and are a part of the programming for Necronomicon every year, every other year as well. Yeah. Um, so that's obviously, that's one thing that we can certainly happily mention again. Um, for those people who have never been to Necronomicon, um, you may have some idea of what it's like, but we really strive to make it a very multifaceted event where, so there's sort of a core amount of programming that's built around panels, uh, academic speakers, um, as well as author readings, and kind of kind of sort of the standard stuff you'd expect at a literary conference or convention. Um, but then we also do um, a track of talks that are um, emergent scholarship, essentially, in Lovecraftian and weird fiction academics. Um, we call that the Armitage Symposium. Um, and then as well, there's a whole bunch of other things that uh, that are included um, to kind of make it a really well-rounded event and have people really kind of come to Providence and enjoy the city um, and have a good time, uh, as well as kind of have their brain stimulated. Right, because all, everything that happens at Necronomicon is not just happening, you know, at in the buildings in where it, it takes place. You've got yeah. like walking tours and, and so forth. You want to start with that? Yeah. Uh, so that's one thing. One of the things that we like to offer every time is really the opportunity for people to not just be sitting in some room somewhere. Like I kind of make the joke and, and hopefully not too many people from Topeka, Kansas hate me when I make this joke. But, uh, you know, we don't want it to be an experience where it's just uh, you could just be sitting in a room anywhere, you know, some convention hall somewhere. So we really try to decentralize the convention, make people go out and walk around Providence. Um, so, you know, to the point where we do organize walking tours and bus tours around the city, kind of highlighting um, history of Providence, but also, of course, you know, Lovecraft's connection to Providence as well. Um, and, you know, in addition, many of the events that we organize that are sort of, you know, substantial staple parts of the convention like film screenings are ones that require you to essentially walk a few blocks away from some of the main venues and um, really kind of have a good time exploring Providence. Uh, so, just comment right. that uh, for the person who's going to go for the first time, don't go expecting that you're going to be able to experience everything. It's so rich. It's so layered. There's so many things to do. You've got to choose. Some of, there's, at one point, there's going to be a game you want to play, a movie you want to see, a panel you want to see, and a walking tour is starting, and you're going to have to pick one, and you just enjoy the moment. You know, Do what suits you, and if you can't go to this convention and have a wonderful time, that, I mean, you just, you just have to. It's, it's really wonderful. So I will, on that note, I will <laughs> share that I guess it was the last one, I spent the entire convention stalking Stuart Gordon, <laughs> trying to get him to sign something for me. And no matter what happened, I couldn't get near him. We, I was off by five minutes or whatnot. And I finally just gave up. Four days, I gave up. Monday morning, I'm having breakfast, and he sits down next to me. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Well, this well, is that's, that's another point, Pete, is that part of the convention isn't going to the meeting, per se. It's sitting with all your friends, meeting new people. Yeah. Not only saying hello to that author you really like or the artist whose work you admire. Going to the – it's, it's, it's 
going to the bar with your friends rather than yeah, and, and that's up. a really great point because all those writers that you like you know whether it's john langan or or or, or laird baron they're there they're walking around they're participating they're they're friendly warm generous people um i, I don't see this particular convention as a convention I think for Lovecraftians and fans of weird fiction, it's more like a weekend where you get to spend at summer camp with your friends. You're whether weekend you're at, Howard. at a camp. I'm sorry. Weekend at Howard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he I, is I mean that's what it is. Um, you know, you look at some of the post Necronomicon Providence pictures that that get posted. Uh, after the convention, and you will see outside the Biltmore and, and, you know, half a block, here are all these people who so many of us don't get to interact on a regular basis, and the street is full of them, and they're laughing and sharing stories. Um, I, I really think of it as, as a gathering of the tribe. It, it, it's, it's a wonderful event. Um, this will be my third time and basically never heard anybody complain. Everybody walks away thinking this is the best convention I ever attended. And to my mind, that's exactly true. Niels, before I forget, we have a question from the live audience. Um, uh, question is, any word as to when responses will start coming out on Pickman's gallery? Because if I don't ask that now, I'll, I'll, I'll forget. Did we lose Niels? Sorry, it's, uh, I've got like 15 more stories to read, and then i got to talk it over with Sam. So it's close. It's close. But I got, oh, I got no, I, I was thinking it was, never mind. I just, uh, my brain just went off. I thought we were talking about something from Necronomicon, because isn't there like a, Art judging thing, or am I thinking of uh, oh, film festival? That's the Ars Necronomica, or something. Yeah, something like that. So, Niels, you still there? We did lose Niels. Uh, well, didn't Joey Zone? Uh, wasn't he in charge of that before? The art, yeah. Yeah, I. And and the art that's been displayed, uh, I mean. It's yeah. just phenomenal You're, to see so, and, and you get to meet them. You know, I mean, you know, there's people like Nick Gucker sitting at a table, sell it, selling his art, drawing things for people. Um, as Matt said, whatever day it is, whatever part of the day it is, you're going to look at the convention schedule and go, wow, this is great. Oh, I got to go to that. Oh, I'd love to hear that reading. And you're going to have to pick and choose. You're going to miss things that you would really enjoy because the, there's too many fruits to sample. Plus, plus, it's not just that. It's like you'll say, okay, there's three panels going on right now and, and a reading, and, and hey, look, everyone's going to the bar. <laughs> this audio's convention, you know? You just yeah, want to usually, have fun. I usually go for the last one there. All right. So we had this problem with Niels last time he was on here. I had um, my video tests with him. The video tests always go great. And then when he's on the show, he seems to phase in and out. So I'm sure he'll come back in a minute while we're waiting on him. Yeah. I mean, th this year, look at the guests. We could. Ellen Datlow is guest of honor. Stephen Graham Jones, who was just nominated for uh, uh, best novel for Mongrels for Shirley Jackson Award. Um, he's one of the writers. Uh, it, it's it, Peter Straub is attending. I mean, come on, Peter Straub. Um, great guests. Mike Davis will be there. Well, okay. Mm, yep. they're, they're dramatic presentations. I got to go the first year. I went to the opening event at the Anthenaeum when they unveiled the Lovecraft bust. And they did a, a reading of the play Night Gaunts with the guy who originally played Lovecraft and a lot of the original actors. The next two years later, uh, Starry Wisdom and Lehman Kessler did a performance of a play about Lovecraft and Sonia. 
Sonia Green. Now, these were real dramatic presentations of the life of Lovecraft that were really outstanding. Who knows what they're going to do this year? They, there were performances by uh, the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society of their, um, their, their dramatic uh, radio plays. The New York City Radio Theater came and did this wonderful Curse of Yig. I mean, there's so much stuff there that's just so wonderful. Yeah, Niels, for you phased out there, um, yep. I confused a question about Matt's upcoming book that he's editing with Micah, which is a good question, too. Uh, Matt's book? No, 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 no. I, the, isn't there a, uh, a uh, no art judging contest? Oh, there is, there is, yeah, there is um, an yeah. art exhibition. That's one of the things that we do every, for every Necronomicon. We have a pretty substantial arts component, art as Necronomicon. Um, this year, it's uh, going to be at a, one of the largest galleries in Providence that's owned by uh, RISD, by Rhode Island School of Design, called the Woods Gary Gallery. It just happens to be across the street from um, the last house that Lovecraft lived in, which is pretty cool. Um, and so right now, I think we have a call for artists. If you go to necronomicon-providence.com, uh, you'll see a link a uh, page on there um, under our main header um, called Ars Necronomica, and that's a link to submissions for art. They're still accepting art, I believe, until um, the next few three weeks, I think they're still accepting art submissions for that show. Um, and that's in addition to, I think we already have 25 artists that we've selected to be kind of part of the core show, uh, as well as our artist guest of honor, who's John Jude Palancar this year, which is pretty exciting. Um, Niels, by the way, I, I recall, and I said this while you were gone, your we always do great on our video test, but your computer doesn't seem to like the show. Well, so, so this, yeah, I don't know it. what it is about that. Like, I have zero problem. Except, <laughs> well, this time I'll blame it on my internet provider. Uh, I, I clearly need to get a new inter internet provider. Or maybe it's the Russians. I don't know what's going on But lately. Well, I was just going to say, just do what you did just now. Just just click the link, come on back yeah. in, and we'll talk till we, till we see you again. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sure we can always think you know, of something one, to say. Mike, one thing I really wanted to say real quick. Uh, yes, please. Before folks were talking, um, one of the things that I think a lot of us are really proud of with Necronomicon uh, is that it's really become a big community uh, and we're really happy to see so many uh, friendships and uh, allegiances and, uh, and collaborations kind of come out of this. Um, you know, so many authors and editors and uh, projects have really sort of found their footing, um, you know, like um, Sam Cowan's Dim Shores, which are incredible. You know, a lot of that was stuff that was inspired by connections that Sam was making at Necronomicon. Um, and that's really pretty exciting for us to see, and it kind of makes us feel good about um, the insanity we go through to put it on. So Yeah, a lot of projects are born out of that convention. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty exciting to see. We, yeah, we, 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 they sure are. Yeah, and, you know, for us, for us that that's, makes it far more rewarding than just, you know, thinking of it as just those four days. Um, you know, it's it's important for us to feel like we're doing this really, really arduous task um, for something bigger than just those four days. And so it's it's great to see people really kind of take take it and run. You know, um, makes us feel happy. So why don't we why don't we talk a bit about the panels next? Because I'm on the panels page right now. I'm looking at it, and there are a hell of a lot of panels. Uh, Forty nine panels. Yep. Yeah, that's right. So, oh, that was the other thing I was going to mention. So, yeah, the panels, obviously, that's really sort of the, the, the skeleton by which, you know, all the rest of the convention meat hangs, if you'll allow that analogy. Um, the panels are, I think, an hour, a little over an hour each. Uh, and we've really put a lot of effort this year into having it be a very broad spectrum selection of panels. So, Roughly a quarter of them deal very much directly with Lovecraft. Another quarter deal kind of with the larger um, circle of classic weird, you know, um, Robert Chambers, um, Clark Ashton Smith, especially since it's just the 100th anniversary of his birth. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. And um, what was I going to say? And uh, another quarter dealing with more contemporary weird authors and artists. And then another quarter that's sort of pop culture 
some weird pop culture Lovecraftiana. Um, so yeah, between I think 48 or 49 panels, it's a really remarkable. I think we have that divided up into three different tracks. So at any at any given time, there are probably going to be three different panels to choose from. Um, so like so like Matthew was saying, uh, there's always uh, a struggle to see which direction you want to go in. Um, and that, those are just the panels. That's not counting, you know, academic yeah. speakers. Uh, it's not counting author readings that are also simultaneously happening and not even counting the external stuff like film screenings, um, walking tours, gaming, etc. cetera. Um, so at any given time, there's probably at least six or seven different things you could be choosing from to do. Um, but yeah, the panels are absolutely the most sort of the core, the crux yeah. of the convention, if you will. Well, this question on that then, uh, obviously there'll be a schedule what available for people when they get there. Will there be one online available for folks to kind of plan their weekend ahead of time? Oh, definitely, somehow? yeah. Yeah, we I mean, normally, uh, we're probably ahead of where we normally are. Normally we get that schedule up, at least some kind of loose version of it, a month or two out. Um, I think we should be probably looking at about two months out. We'll have a pretty good schedule. Um, subject to some movement, but um, we're going to be we're we're going to try to be much better. In the past, we've kind of done a little bit of juggling right up until like the last week or so, simply just because you know sometimes things happen um, that we can't foresee. But yeah. I think we're in a good position where we probably will be able to have a good set schedule at least a month out and have that pretty much solid for people to plan around. And I should have said at the beginning, or I, th I think, I don't know if anyone did say, but the convention is August 17th through the 20th, correct? Yeah. And uh, if you want a ticket, it's at necronomicon-providence.com. So that's an, the easiest way to get a ticket. Um, maybe let's spend a little bit more time on the panels. Like, I, obviously, we can't list all these panels. There's too many of them. But uh, the Thomas Ligotti panel, uh, I'm Let's see here. Yay. <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, writing non stale Lovecraftian tales. That looks interesting. <laughs> I'm not on that. Cause, You're not? No, because I write stale Lovecraftian tales. Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you can be in the crowd throwing spitballs at or something like that. I, I, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I should also mention. Um, Oh, I have to look up the email. So we have an email for folks that are interested in being on panels. Um, there are still a few panels where we're looking for folks to help out and chip in. Um, so I'll, I'll look that up in just a second what the email, actually, I can just look it up real quick, what the email is for that, um, for okay. authors or academics who have some experience with, you know, and see a panel that kind of speaks to them. Um, we will... Um, We've already been contacting. We, most of the panels already are fairly well fleshed out with, with panelists, the people that are gonna be on them. Um, but that's something that we're still, again, kind of working out exactly. Uh, and well, there's also yeah, been a couple- Yeah, and S.J. Bagley are doing a great job with, with the panels, because I've had a bunch of communications with both. And, and they both should get much acclaim for what they're doing. Yeah, absolutely. They should, I, should, I should actually mention um, the the panels committee is actually three people. I'm I'm sort of you know tangentially on it, but it's primarily uh, Sam Gafford, uh, S. J. Bagley, and Farrah uh, Farrah Smith, who are all local people. You know, local, roughly around the Providence area. Um, Sam Gafford has been doing uh, Necronomicon programming since the original Necronomicon um, back in the '90s and early 2000s. Um, so it, it's really fortunate to be able to have him. Um, he's he's really done a substantial amount of incredibly hard and at times very stressful work helping to put it together. Um, like I said, this sort of this programming is is again really sort of the core for the convention. So um, it's important for me um, to make sure that we have a committee that is representative of a variety of um, backgrounds and interests. Uh, you know, for, for the Necronomicon. So I'm really proud to see those three committee members really kind of step up and help shape the panels. Anyone that looks at the panels list, um, I should say there's a lot of work that went into it. And I think we're all pretty proud of how well-rounded, there's plenty of new, plenty of things that we could have plugged in that simply we couldn't quite fit in. Um, we had several amazing ideas. Every year this happens, several amazing ideas that had to get cut. 
Um, there is a little bit of change. I think we're going to lose one or two panels that are on there that um, we think are a little bit redundant. Um, I'm very happy to say one of my favorite panels that got cut previously is getting added in, and that's a Mary Shelley panel since it's the 200th anniversary of um, Frankenstein, which which I think is going to be pretty awesome. Um, that's going to be one of the panels I'm going to allow myself to be sitting at for sure. So. I'm really looking forward to this dark crimes, the weird yeah. noir fiction. That was yeah. that was actually one of my other ideas. That was a, a oh, panel great. that I really wanted to see done too, just because I love so many like the really, really sort of grim uh, noir stuff that sometimes I think borders on uh, almost being weird fiction. You know, if not some of it straight up, like some Chester Himes, for example. I think it's just some of the weirdest crime fiction ever. Um, so I'm pretty excited that that, that panel made the cut. But, Jack um, O'Connell would be somebody who'd be great for that. I was just going to ask, do you know off the top of your head who's going to be on that panel? That's just one of the ones I don't want to mess. It just sounds um, very interesting. I don't recall off the top of my head right now. No. That, that's fine. I can look it up pretty quick. but yeah. Any other panels that you want to touch on? Uh, um, I'm trying to think. Uh, yeah, because I was curious about the um, the Weird International panel, if you have anyone specific lined up for that. It's kind of an area of weird fiction that doesn't get um, too much attention until recently. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that's, for us, that's really kind of a core thing, because we've always wanted to have Necronomicon be this sort of international hub, and it has been. I mean, we, the last Necronomicon in 2015, we had, you know, 2,000 attendees um, from 18 different countries and five continents. So that's pretty international. But, you know, um, I think, you know, the one easy critique that, you know, folks can make of weird fiction is very often it's a little too uh, monocultural, you know, and, and I, uh, I don't mean that as, a, as substantially as a slam, but, it, but it's definitely um, a goal for us. And I think it's a goal for many uh, weird fiction authors and editors and um, projects to kind of steer towards being much more inclusive and, and having new weird voices. Um, or, you know, in some cases, uh, weird voices that have been out there all along, but not as recognized as they probably should be. Um, Absolutely, and you're to be commended for that. Yeah, it, I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I hope we're going to be commended for that. I mean, it's still an ongoing process. It's something that uh, requires a tremendous amount of effort. As for the, the Weird International panel, um, one of the frustrations with it is sort of the recent political climate uh, has made it so that some people are either reluctant or outright worried uh, about coming to the United States, folks that we'd really been relying on coming and being a part of the conversation, part of the community, um, are now uh, hesitant for um, some, some relatively good reasons. Um, you know, there's been a few unfortunate stories of uh, authors and such having trouble crossing the border. Um, so that's that's been a little bit upsetting to us, us and it, but it's making it so that we're kind of even more determined to try to be active about recruiting people um, and making sure voices yeah. that aren't normally heard are heard. Um, so I know one of the one of the um, people that I know is on that panel is one of our guests of honor, um, Nettie Akorafor, who's kind of winning awards right and left for her remarkable. Um, um, uh, weird, her remarkable vision of weird fiction, which um, we're really excited to be able to uh, highlight as well. Um, so she's one of the people, um, I'm all of a sudden totally blanking. I'll, I'll dig up in a second, I'll dig up a list. But um. uh, Pulp versus Pure Cthulhu. That's one of the gaming uh, greater weirds, I guess, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I think that's, that's uh, you know, because there's sort of this new um, trend in the weird gaming to have really sort of gritty gumshoe kind of uh, angled gaming. Um, yeah. Okay, anything else to talk about on the panels? Uh, if you want to see those, they're at the website as, as well, folks. necronomicon providencecom slash programming. Okay, I've got, I have to, another comment about the panels. It's just you're going to go yeah. there's generally no problem getting a seat but if it's something that you think is going to be really popular you may want to get there a few minutes early to get in there's they don't take tickets you know it's like it's first come first serve sometimes people stand in the back uh, but usually I've not heard of anyone not being able to get into any of the panels they want to see 
Uh, Rick, you had a comment or question? Yeah, Niels, you mentioned a Robert W. Chambers panel. I couldn't find it in the list of uh, panels. Oh, um, I uh, that might be an error on my on our part for not adding it, but I'm pretty sure there is a. I'm 99% positive there is a, a Chambers ad, um, or I'm in a Chambers panel. I'll have to double check. I, I'm I, I never saw it. I'm completely unaware of it. Okay. All right. It's I will have to double check. To add my name. <laughs> it, it, well, it, yeah, a lot of us want to be on it if you when you add it. Let me let me check with the panels committee because I'm 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 I'd be surprised if it's not on there. Um, but I'll find out for sure. Um, I just, oh, the, by the way, the email for folks that see if you do see programming uh, panels that you're interested in, um, the web the email address is np oh, where to go uh, np programming um, 2017. I'm sorry, np 2017 programming at gmail.com. So N as in Necronomicon, P as in Providence, 2017 programming at gmail.com. Um, and that will go right to the panels committee for all of them to look at, all three of them to check out. Um, all right, you want to talk about guests? Yeah. So, yeah, so we have uh, um, nine. I think we got, we got a little bit carried away. We have nine plus a couple sort of special, special guests. Um, that uh, that are being featured. So I already mentioned Nnedi Okorafor. In addition to that, um, one of our other author guests is Stephen Graham Jones, um, another person who seems to be just sort of constantly winning awards and really kind of stretching the boundaries uh, of weird fiction. Um, uh, John Jude Palancar, I mentioned, who's our artist guest of honor. Um, our poet laureate for this year, we're really excited about, especially again, his connection, his direct connection to um, Clark Ashton Smith is Donald Sidney Fryer, who's kind of one of those epic legendary figures in, in weird fiction um, and, and weird poetry. Um, then uh, Steve Mariconda, who is a, a really well-known um, Lovecraftian academic. Um, he's kind of our um, sort of the main voice representing um, Lovecraftian um, theory and academia. Um, he's, he's essentially the, the S.D. Joshi for the year. And um, I'm forgetting who else all of a sudden. I'm Alan Dallow. Oh, yeah, of course. So, yeah, so we have a couple of uh, important editors, Alan Dallow, who we've been trying to get for the last two Necronomicons. And every single time, it always would be some horrible conflict and she couldn't make it. Um, so we're finally glad to actually be able to nab her and have her join us, um, which is pretty exciting. Um, and then I know I'm going to say this first name yeah. wrong. It's K I. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, Kids Johnson, Kids. who also uh, is another one of our. She's she's both an author as well as has been doing editorial work. But she's a remarkable one who who just won, won like a whole suite of awards from I think two or three different um, competitions. I'm going to completely blank on what they are, but it was it was sort of this amazing you know like trifecta of awards that she won. Uh, and she uh, sort of most recently has done a great book that Tor publishes called uh, Dream Quest of Velvet Bow. Uh, that's sort of a, a re-exploration of some Lovecraftian themes, um, but from the point of view of a woman. And um, it's getting some incredible praise and, and very uh, well worth it. Um, so that's, did I get all the names now? I should. Yeah, I think you did. I, mean, I was looking over the page. Yep. I think yep. you got everybody. Yep, I think that's it. Um, but there's also a few, couple other people. You got John Jude Palancar, right? Yep, yep, our artist yeah, guest of honor. Awesome. For those of you who aren't familiar with John Jude Palancar, he's been, um, similar to Mike Whalen, he's one of those artists that whenever you look at any sort of... No, oh, we just lose him again. Right in mid-sentence, too. Can you hear me? Yep, there you are. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? Guess not. Yeah. <laughs> can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yep, oh, okay. I can hear you. All right. um, there, you're, you're back. I think your computer probably froze. Oh, weird. Okay. You guys still there? All right. Um, John Jude Palancar, yep. who has done a number of um, the really sort of big um, publications, soft, uh, paperbacks of Lovecraft collections lately, 
um, as well as a few other collections of uh, weird fiction covers for Tor and a few other publishers. Um, he's an artist that we've been wanting to, to work with for a long time, so we're pretty excited to have him on board for this year. Um, but there's other names. I, one other real important name I should mention, um, somebody who's sort of kind of in the nebulous land between guest of honor and sort of sort of uh, hierophant, if you will, for the entire convention, and that's actually our own Joe Pulver, uh, who who essentially is, is sort of the, the guiding light re religious figure, if you will, for the convention. Um, who we're really happy to be able to drag him back across the Atlantic um, to kind of be. Uh, I had no um, idea Joe was a religious figure. Yeah, Did well, you just you know, call it, Joe Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> Joe, Joe didn't know he was a religious figure. If Joe's a religious figure, he should appear at the prayer breakfast. <laughs> well, well, but see, that's, well, that's, that's, wait a minute, that's Cody's gig. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we'll see, we'll see. But, um, Oh yeah, we hadn't even talked about the uh, prayer breakfast, but or or is it going to be a gala? Uh, so there's going to be all of those things for sure. A lot of the, the a lot of the usual programming that people now expect, like the Eldritch Ball and the Cthulhu prayer breakfast and those kind of things, are all going to happen. Um, but but yeah, Joe, I don't want to let you off the hook too much. Joe is is uh, sort of the the one figure that we kind of most have become dependent on uh, being a central figure, um, sort of the, the central guiding light slash gadfly, if you will, for the, for the convention. Um, and uh, we're, so to the point where we were worried he wouldn't be able to attend uh, and needed to get him here because there's simply, it doesn't seem like that could be a proper Necronomicon without Joe at the center of it. Um, so we're happy to be having him and Kat come over and join us. Uh, for their now third wedding anniversary as well, right? Yep, yep. Which is pretty. I awesome. am I am deeply humbled and consider myself extremely privileged to be able to attend these. Um, uh, last time for for the you know, Necronomicon for in '15, we did the Doom Came to Providence chapbook, which is. I, I know it doesn't, it, you know, sort of went under the radar, but it was one of the best projects I had the opportunity to curate. And this time, instead of doing a round robin, we're going to do um, a charity anthology for the convention, which I have all the tales in hand. And um, it's called Walk on the Weird Side. Um, it's filled with... All kinds of people, most of which will be at the convention. People like um, Chris Slatsky and uh, Matthew Bartlett. Uh, Farrah Smith is in the book. A um, lot of fun people. Um, so we'll be premiering that at the convention. Um, and that's a, probably another thing. Is there be, there's a number of books this time and, and it has been in the past that have premiered at the convention so expect um group signings and for people who are attending that may not know about this and we'll get Niels to talk about it some there's a little store just a few blocks from the biltmore and if you are a lovecraftian or a weird fiction fan you step inside this little store, and you're going to think you're in the greatest bookstore in the universe. Um, really and truly, um, just about everything you hear about, and you never get to see a copy in a store, sits there calling your name. Um, because of the mass amount of creators who attend the convention, a lot of these copies are signed. Um, depending on what time it is, you may see some of these creators hanging out in the store because it is a truly marvelous place. And um, so I, I'm really privileged to get to edit something again for the convention this year. And Niels, tell everybody about the store, which is a fabulous place. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you, Joe. <laughs> 
you make me blush too much. Um, so we, we have as part of the nonprofit that we that we run here um, that that runs an economic con, we have a storefront. We got a really nice grant uh, a couple of years ago from Hippocampus Press. Essentially, um, Derek Hussey helped us get a secure grant to essentially make a permanent place for um, for fans of Lovecraft coming to Providence from around the world. Uh, and just sort of, you know, essentially be the hub for the weird fiction uh, activities that we take on. Um, and with that grant, uh, we managed to open up essentially what was going to be just an office space, but we realized we might as well make it into a visitor center slash bookstore. Uh, and it's become really reasonably successful. Um, it's a lot of work also, but uh, it's a really great place for folks from around the world. Uh, literally just about every day we have somebody come in from um, Poland or Argentina or Spain or Italy um, or China. We just had a whole ch family from China the other uh, last week come in who were just so incredibly excited to be able to come to Providence and find this sort of stopping point. Um, and uh, as Joe said, we, you know, obviously the, the core of it, uh, we sell as much weird fiction as we can, uh, including a number of um, Lovecraft Zine titles, which were pretty are always generally very easy to sell. Um, Autumn Cthulhu is hard to keep in stock. Um, and it's just sort of a, a good sort of hangout place for folks that are interested in weird or interested in Lovecraft. Um, so we also organize, in addition to an Economicon, we also organize usually about every other month or so a, a weekend of author readings that are a big success. Uh, actually, probably the next one, speaking of the Shirley Jackson Awards earlier, um, we're for the second time, we did this last year, we're going to do it again this, this summer, um, I think next month, we're going to partner up with the Shirley Jackson Awards Committee and do a special Shirley Jackson Awards author reading, including some of the nominees um, who are going to come to Providence to do special readings for that, which is pretty exciting. We had a great time doing it last year. Um, those are incredible folks that we love to work with, so um, we're excited to do that again. And that's just yeah, kind of one of the things we try to do. And at the convention itself this year, you got a whole bunch of the Shirley Jackson Award nominees attending. Right. Well, like, okay. like you said, Joe, I mean, um, in addition to sort of just standard blocks of author readings that you might expect at a convention like this, we, we do a lot of book release parties as well. A lot of publishers time a, a special anthology release for around Economicon because they often have so many of the authors there. Um, so we'll like dedicate a block or two, you know, an hour block or two to some of these special releases and have all the authors there or, you know, a substantial number of the authors there who then do a reading or whatever. Um, and that's, that's pretty neat to see. And it, you know, just sort of happens to work out well that, like you said, so many of the folks are there all in one place. And that's a pretty rare thing. And, and, and you know, again, not only are, are these creators there, but you are going to find that these are very warm, friendly, generous people. Um, you, you, you come home seeing them in a, in, in a much different light. Um, because just, I, I know I've been approached several times over the years. And, you know, I'm just a fan. Is things that, the kind of thing I hear. And it is, there are no... I'm just a fan. You're not just a fan. Because as all us creators, every single one of us, we started as readers, we're still readers, we are fans. It just, we happen to create this material as well. So just because you're only a consumer, if, if you deem to see yourself in that light, not this convention. This is, again, a gathering of the tribe. It's community it's family it really is Niels what about uh, movies I know the film festival they're the big ones for this but you'll be showing movies as well right you're partnering with uh, Gwen and Brian that's right yeah we're partnering with Gwen and Brian again um, so it, it, like what we've done the past two times uh, we do a small block of shorts that our film committee uh, has selected Phil Gillat is one of the um, is the the committee head for the film section. Uh, I think Phil's been on Lovecraft Easy before, right? He's the he's the guy who, who's the yeah. screenwriter for uh, Europa Report. 
Um, and he, yeah, he, he has a really nice guy too. Yeah. He's an amazing guy. He just finished up, uh, a film version of Laird Barron's, uh, short story 30. And he's now, um, actually, Oh, I can't say he's working on another even more exciting, well, equally exciting project for another really great weird fiction author who I probably, who I think has probably also been on uh, Easy and before, but I don't know if I'm allowed to say names yet. Um, but we'll probably hear more about that very soon. But so the, the film's section involves some, you know, usually we highlight four or so feature length films, um, usually a couple of classics, and then a couple of more recent films, uh, and then a whole bunch of blocks of shorts including uh, usually two blocks of shorts from the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival, like sort of their greatest hits, uh, and then ones that we've selected as well. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, gaming. Yeah. Want to talk uh, about gaming at all? Yeah, the, the, so, you know, we can't, again, because we try to make the convention very uh, sort of holistic, if you will, um, kind of going back to, Joe's comments about sort of this being a more of a community. We really like to make the convention very, very much a, uh, a multifaceted two-way street where it's not just attendees going and being consumers, you know, and, and just standing in line to have, uh, I don't know, Bruce Campbell's signature or something like that. Like, that's not at all our philosophy. We want to have people engage and, and not be just fans, but people that are part and feel like they can come and be part of the community. Um, and again, like we talked about before, so many of them then go on to maybe actually be engaged and, and become authors or publishers. Um, and similarly for the gaming, we uh, try to encourage folks to take on a role of running their own games or if they're game designers that are you know, just starting getting started, they can come and um, you know, pitch a game and, and run their own game. Um, so the, the gaming component is obviously sort of a natural um, substantial component, anywhere from, you know, typical Call of Cthulhu role-playing games or um, some of the board games like Arkham Horror up to some really elaborate live-action role-play, uh, including um, one that I think is going to be part two of a uh, LARP that happened in 2015, sort of a, a Belle Epoque, uh, Robert Chambers-themed um, LARP that's going to be happening again this year. Um, Really, so that's interesting. Part, and I should mention also, the gamers. You know, so often the the you know, um, at, when you try to combine gaming with other aspects of a typical convention, sometimes it, it seems too much like two very separate conventions. Um, and we really try to make it not that not be the case. That being said, the gamers are getting the very best room of the entire convention. They have the 18th floor of the Biltmore, which looks out across College Hill you know, across pretty much all of the, you know, the more famous Lovecraft sites in Providence are all sort of the backdrop for the gaming section. Um, so they're pretty lucky in that way. But. I'll have to go up to that floor just for the view. Pretend yeah, like yeah, I'm watching them play, play yeah. games. <laughs> uh, Joe wants you to talk about the dealer's room. Ah, uh, yes. the dealer. Okay, so that's another aspect too. Um, I think right now we're looking at about 80 dealers, 80 vendors of different kinds. So we have a bunch of artists that are going to be selling their wares, several publishers, a uh, whole bunch of booksellers. You know, from you know new uh, current titles to uh, booksellers selling classic, old, uh, weird fiction and collectibles, um, and then a lot of sort of just strange, peculiar um, uh, vendors as well that sell really sort of unique. And we're, we're pretty, uh, the vendor hall sells out really quickly. Like we've basically been maxed out in the vendor hall since uh, essentially we opened the doors for it six months ago or so. Um, so we're really pretty selective about the kind of vendors that we have. We really try to make sure um, it's a quality selection. Uh, and it's been a, a very good experience for all, all people. Everyone generally goes into the vendor hall excited uh, and leaves with their arms full and their pockets probably somewhat empty. Uh, and the vendors like likewise also leave really happy. Like they feel like it's it's the most engaged community that they can um, sell to essentially. So they're always very pleased. But, um, how much are tickets, and what are the different tier levels of tickets? So the only tier level now uh, is the the standard uh, what we call the pilgrimage pass, um, just the general admission. Uh, you sold out. Oh yeah, the the, the VIP uh, passes they sell out. Uh, one tier sells out within five minutes, and the, the second tier oh, wow. now sells out within an hour. So, yeah, those are long gone. 
Um, but the general pass is eighty dollars, and that includes access to pretty much everything. Uh, you know, the only stuff that that doesn't really get you into is um, the some of the sort of secondary events like the Cthulhu Prayer Breakfast and the Eldritch Ball, uh, and then you know some of the smaller VIP parties that are just for the guests and things like that. But, um, but so that gets you into most things, and then. You know, in addition, um, we have to charge a little extra for the the tours, the bus tours in particular, because those we get charged a lot for those. But. Right, right. Okay, did we forget to talk about anything in regards to the convention? Is there anything that I didn't ask or that we didn't cover? Um, I'm trying to think. Oh, so one other thing, we do have. Uh, I think the website is updated on this, but I need to plug in one more thing. Um, we, for those of you who don't have 80 bucks in your pocket or want to save those $80 for the vendor hall, we are uh, definitely looking for volunteers to help out. And in exchange for two half-day shifts, um, we can have, uh, we'll give you a, a, a free general pass. Um, oh, and you get a free t-shirt too, a minion t-shirt. <laughs> and that works out really well, you know, because that honestly, that's like a pretty good especially deal. for folks who maybe, you know, Actually. might be a little bit too shy and they kind of want to hang out with, you know, you know, their heroes or whatever, and, and don't realize they could just go up and talk to Joe Pulver without having to worry about it. Um, it gives people... I'll, I'll be a minion for a t-shirt, hell. <laughs> hell, I'm worried about talking to Joe. <laughs> I want to say it's something. It's not too you bad once you get past the bodyguards. <laughs> I want to say something about your minions. Okay. I don't know how you did it, but somehow or another, you've been able to do something with your minions that most cons can't do, and and that's empower them to actually solve problems. Yeah, I mean, we we try to get minions that you yeah. know have a few brain cells to rub together. It helps. I think. It's it's amazing what these guys are able to do with very little you know, back and forth with department heads. Um, yeah, Pete's right. You don't get, hey, I'll get back to you. Wait a minute. What you do is you present a question or an issue to somebody, and it gets resolved. Yeah. And these are, to, to the last person, Every minion that I have encountered, and I hate to use the word minion um, because I don't want to belittle these people, were warm and friendly, and they weren't doing a job. They were engaged. They were enjoying helping people. Just a marvelous, marvelous crowd. It's another facet of the convention that turns it from a regular old convention into a community event. Um, they, they can't be applauded enough. Uh, I have one other comment kind of along these lines in terms of the total experience. Um, I know that there's issues with um, harassment in fan culture sometimes, but I think the Necronomicon has done a very good job with a uh, sort of zero tolerance policy for harassment uh, that has made it very comfortable for everybody there. I've not heard of well, one thing, <laughs> but that it's hard to control a speaker. But uh, there, it's been very—I've never heard of anyone going there and feeling like they were harassed. Well, Kelly did touch me, but uh, well, that's different. That's Kelly. You know, yeah. you, you got. Let me let, let me chime in here again. I know I'm a big mouth, but this this I know from personal experience. Zero tolerance is zero tolerance. Um, this is, again, th this is a group of people who are coming together to enjoy themselves, to celebrate something that they, have, they absolutely adore. Um, some people plan on this for two years. Some people save money for a year just to get to this thing. Um, the, the committee and all, all the volunteers, the minions, everyone, goes out of their way to make sure that everyone has a good time. And um, there, nothing is, none of this crap is tolerated. Um, and, and the convention is to be con commended for that, 
for making sure that everyone is safe um, and has a good time. But again, I don't, I don't see any aspect, any facet of this convention that's like so many other conventions we hear about and we hear very unfortunate things about. Yeah, we, I mean, I think part of that is, I mean, I think there's a, a variety of factors. I, we, we can't really accept all the credit for that. A lot of that is really good fortune. Um, we, we definitely try to be very upfront about um, our stance on that and, and try to remind people despite kind of some of the nonsense that happens uh, on social media, on Facebook, for example, where I think people all too often forget their common humanity uh, and say really unfortunate things. I think one of the strengths of Necronomicon is it's the opportunity for some people um, where they can come together and remember what they have in common uh, with people that otherwise they, you know, um, social media may allow to get overblown. Um, and, and as much as possible, we try to make a setting where open dialogue is encouraged, uh, where there are no, um, no real limits on what can positively be said, uh, even if it's a critical discussion. Um, but at the same time to make sure that people always know that they're welcome and that, uh, you know, intolerance is, is not something that we are going to tolerate. Um, and that goes, you know, across the board for everybody. Um, so so that, that's something that, you know, we definitely try to actively work towards. But really the bigger thing is we are incredibly fortunate uh, that for whatever reason it is, and this is something that every year afterwards, some of us get we get together and we're like how is it that we are so lucky that the people that come to necronomicon the people in the weird fiction community are really good people you know like 99.9 .9 of them are amazing kind charitable supportive people uh that's not uh, something you see in the, the sort of the greater human society generally um, so, you know, it's partly our policy, partly good fortune, but most of it, I think, is just a, the, speaks well to the community as a whole. Well, last but not least, before you go, we should probably talk about lodging. You want, anything you want to say on that? Yes. Uh, if you're looking for lodging, um, act quickly. Uh, the Biltmore has been sold out for a while. Everyone sort of is drawn to the... the charisma of the Billmore, if you will, um, especially because it's actually a Lovecraft site. You know, so many of his letters he actually wrote on Biltmore stationery. Um, so I, I imagine all those Biltmore stationery pads that are in hotel room, in the hotel rooms disappear. Um, there's sort of a weird <laughs> spike in those uh, attrition. I did not steal any Biltmore stationery. <laughs> um, but the, the other, the second, you know, the, the two main, sort of the two pillars, if you will, of Necronomicon are the Biltmore and the Omni for the core programming. Um, the Omni still has a fair number of rooms left in it. Uh, and then we're also um, probably gonna set up another block of rooms at a, a hotel that's as, as close by as any of the, these two are to each other. So um, there is lodging there. If you go to the main website, necronomicon Providence, you'll see a lodgings section under visitors um, that lists the links to the Omni. I think it still says the same link to the Biltmore, but that's don't even bother trying there anymore. Um, but the Omni is great. Uh, some folks haven't stayed there because they, again, have this preconception, but um, they should definitely jump on the Omni if they can. And then somebody the like I actually fantastic. know with somebody. I love the Omni. Yeah, the Omni is great. The Omni is really good. Um, yeah. Omni, fa fabulous it, it, hotel. Be be best bed I ever slept in yeah. that was not my own. So I'll, I'll tell you a, a really funny story. Uh, Carmen, who's the, my wife, who's the co-organizer for the convention, she and I uh, were amazingly well treated by the Omni staff. And we, we la the previous year, we'd stayed at home, which was a disaster. So for the last Necronomicon, we wanted to stay at one of the hotels. The Omni said they had a room for us, and they surprised us by giving us essentially the penthouse suite. Um, because, you know, basically we filled up the whole t hotel, so it was partly a thank you, but also I think literally that was all they had left. Um, and it was this gorgeous full floor uh, penthouse. I think it had like 27 bathrooms. I don't know. We lost track. Uh, but, the, <laughs> but the thing is, of course, we literally probably had three or four hours each night to, to sleep in, you know, let alone, you know, do anything else. So we 
barely had time to even acknowledge that we were in this really nice room. So it was completely wasted on us. Uh, it's kind of funny, but we could have slept. Yeah, that's pretty time. ironic. We almost were ready to sleep standing up as tired as we get usually. But. Well, is not is it Elmwood Park? Isn't that available for sleeping in? Oh, the <laughs> the, the fancy uh, um, Victorian manor. Well, I was, wait, hold on. I'll look it yeah. up. No, Burnside Park. Oh, Burnside. Oh, yeah, yeah. We can camp out on Burnside Park. Yeah. yeah. yeah bring a tent. Yeah. yeah. Well, we'll probably have cots in the basement of our store, which, like Joe said, is just a couple blocks away anyway. So. And, uh. and, and, and there's another point, because we haven't talked about this, but for those of us who don't spend much time in the United States anymore, um, is you walk out of the Biltmore and there's during the day there's food trucks and the restaurants that are within walking distance that are a few blocks away um wow yeah there's some great well, food trucks yeah and restaurants the food trucks were fabulous there's a, a a mexican place about four blocks away i didn't want to leave yeah that was good that i was, just want you know i mean I just wanted, I, well, it was unfortunate because I'm married, but I wanted to marry the chef. And, like, I, hell, I would have spent the rest of my life sleeping on one of the tables. If, but the, 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 the local restaurants that are within walking distance, there's a million that are great. Um, so food, you're going to have a good time. Yeah, that actually reminds me, um, one other big change this year from previous years, we're expanding the lunch hour to an hour and a half to make yeah. it a little bit easier for people to run out and get food. Um, that, was, uh, that was the thanks of uh, Donovan Laux, who's kind of one of our oversight people for some of the planning that we do. Um, just, you know, it's a good idea. It's not enough time to run out. So, yeah, uh, you'll have a little bit more time to go and take advantage of the food trucks and the great restaurants in the area. Yeah, it's hard to control, especially in a sit-down place, how fast you get your food and, and so forth. Oh, and I should also so. mention, because of that, we're bumping some of the panels into the evening as well. So we're going to have panels going a little bit longer into the evening. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I can't wait. So again, August 17th through the 20th, and there are still tickets available yeah. at necronomicon-providence.com. So, so thank you, Niels. Appreciate yeah, you being on and telling us all about it. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. We'll see you in just a few short months. Yeah, it's yeah. coming quick. Can't Absolutely. Wait. Oh, we hope you're getting a little bit of sleep beforehand. The insomnia hasn't started yet. Usually it has by now, but it's a testament to this is now the third time, uh, and we have a really good crew of organizers helping out on the various committees. Um, I'm, we're definitely feeling a lot better going into this one than we have. So, you know, nothing's ever going to be perfect, uh, but as good as the previous two have been, I think this one's going to be even better. So oh, well, I, I remember you at the first one panicking over everything. And, you know, at least in the community I was hanging out with, who were mostly creators at that point, writers for the most part, we were all having a fantastic time. Everybody we met was having a fantastic time. Everybody was, wow, we'd like to do this every year. And wouldn't it be great if we was two extra more days of this? And you you guys did a phenomenal job. You were sweating over things. Oh, well, this is going on. That's, it, we never saw this. We were there. We attended. We all had a great time. Did you have a comment? And Sorry, Joe. I didn't. You, you yeah. phased out for a second there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let Joe finish up. Yeah, I'm sorry. I you. No, I just wanted to say that on me, perhaps behind the cur curtain, there might have been a bump or two, but out in public, nothing. No evidence of one whatsoever. You know, the, the first one ran as smoothly as anything I've seen. Yeah, I thought so too. Absolutely. Pete, do you have a comment for Niels? I have a question for Niels, and he can he can refuse to answer. <laughs> All right. So you, you work for the feds now. <laughs> well, 
sort of yeah it's a it's a fellowship so so they keep telling me i do not work for them uh, i work with them but, right but i'm so, still in the deep state i get the secret decoder ring and all that kind of stuff yeah yeah i get it and the special parking pass how how did you running necronomicon go over with 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 that because uh, i know i've had my issues <laughs> So, well, so a funny story, the background check is still ongoing, so we'll see how I make out on that. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll be curious. I had my fingerprints taken last week, and they're running the background check right now. So, you may never hear from me again. Um, yeah. I'll be planning this remotely from Guantanamo or something like that. Do we have to refer to you as Mr. Mulder at the convention? <laughs> yeah, it could be. <laughs> Well, you know, custom seems to have a big problem with Cthulhu material. If you've been following what's happening to Cthulhu Wars, they got all their product made and delivered from China. It's being held up for customs for a long period. And I once told you at a time when I traveled on an airplane with a Cthulhu piggy bank and my bag got opened. Really? <laughs> yeah, and when, I, when I got home, I opened my bag and it was this notice, we had to open your bag. Well, to examine suspicious material, and the only thing that I was carrying that I've never carried before was Cthulhu. Well, it's a long tradition going back to when they bombed Innsmouth, you know? Yeah. <laughs> if you actually believe that's what's going on with the Cthulhu War stuff. That's a I don't know, I don't know what, what you're talking about, Rick. They, they have always checked every one of my bags four, five, six times. Yeah, but have you looked at oh, yourself yeah, in the cute. mirror? Exactly. <laughs> I look like a reject from a Bruce Springsteen concert. I couldn't hurt a fly. Hey, the last time I went to Disney with the girls, I got pulled aside for inspection by Disney. Not once, not twice, but three times. I did. Why? Yeah, but they, that's because Disney has access to your FBI dossier. They know about the theft. They know about the... Uh, Crazy parties on the yachts. All right. Well, I'm going to let Niels go. Thanks for being on the show, Niels. All right. Thank you, guys. Appreciate Thanks it. So much, Mike. I look Thanks, forward to brother. seeing you. Look forward to seeing you all here. All right, yeah. Call. Thank you Great very much. You. Take care, Niels. Appreciate it. Bye. See you soon. Bye. All right. Well, again, August 17th to the 20th, and tickets are at Necronomicon Providence. Dot com. I never knew that the other two levels of tiers of uh, tickets went that fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew they went fast, but yeah, yeah well, I didn't that's know they went that fast. I'm not surprised. So, on that note, Mike, you know, the idea of doing a Patreon like dinner, yeah, where, where just mm -hmm. like you, me, and maybe a few other people get together, and we could do it at McCormick and oh. with with the I can go. What's that? I can go. Yeah. yeah dang. <laughs> no, but I was just thinking that, you know, we could get together and do a Patreon dinner at Necronomicon and, you know, we'd do it in the hotel at McCormick and Schmick's, which is, you know. That sounds great. As long as everybody knows it's Dutch, because if I had money, I oh, wouldn't have a Patreon. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's a good idea, Pete. So I guess we need to figure out, I need to write a note to myself to figure out how many people are on the on my Patreon are actually going to. And I, I try, this is why I was asking how many people are going because if we could do like 10 to 15 people for dinner with maybe five, pa five the, the, of us, yeah. I mean, that's a nice little bonus to just sit down with yeah. these people and talk to them nicely. No, that's As a good idea. To, I'll send out an email to all my patrons and which brings up the, the, uh, Obligatory if you want to be a patron, set uh, just Google Lovecraft Easy and Patreon, and uh, I'll also I also always link to it in the YouTube uh, description and the podcast description. However, you're listening or watching. Um. All right, so let's talk about some books. Uh, what are you guys reading? I was reading a book called. And her smile will untether the universe. Uh, by I don't want to say her name wrong, but I'm probably going to. Gwendolyn Keith. Uh, Gwendolyn Keith. Thank you. I'm three quarters of the way through it right now, and I'm really enjoying it. So again, most of the email I get are people 
telling me that they love the recommendations. So there's another one. Yeah, Matt. I am slogging through um, the Lovecraft Code. And this is the. I haven't. That's the one that ASAP just reviewed. Um, to me, the first quarter of it is all a big info dump, and I haven't got to where the plot has actually started to move forward yet. It's just been a struggle. Mm. I'll let you know when I get yeah, to I, the- I had that same problem when I tried to read it a few months ago. Um, it's, I mean, maybe it's worth it, but there's so much out there to read, you know. You know, yeah. that's interesting, Ben. That's the way that I feel about a book, too, that it's it if if I have to force myself to read it, there are just too many books out there that I don't have to, so I tend to put it aside. So. I'm looking over at my pile of 32 be read books. It, it sounds like this book is sort of like a Colin Wilson type book where it gets very literal, lit, you know, researching the sources and things rather than. It's more like I would say it's like the Da Vinci Code. Yeah, I, I was going to compare it to Dan. I, I mean, I'm not a big Dan Brown fan, but that, I was going to point it that way as well. You, um, you leave Dan Brown alone. Oh, that book <laughs> sucked. I mean, I couldn't bear it. It was so popular, and I'd tell people I hated it, and they'd look at me as if I was communist. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's uh, like I, Ellen on Jerry when she was, didn't like the English patient, you know? <laughs> that book well, reminds me, there's a lot of Lovecraftian fiction out there where people kind of get very uh what they think of as scholarly with the fiction and they kind of go off on these tangents and it's after a while you just get kind of bored reading that stuff you, you want to read an actual story yeah agreed that's how colin wilson's the return of the little wig or affected me people read that in tales of the Cthulhu Mythos. yeah yeah a long yeah, time ago if, if you've read his philosopher's stone oh my god yeah that was yeah, but I was, I was what, 20 when that came out? I don't know. Rick, Rick knows how old we were when it came out. I did, in, I did really enjoy parts of that book a lot. I, I, yeah, I mean, no, don't get me wrong, but, you know, at the time, he was probably, you know, I would, let's call it proto Legati. Yeah. yeah, there's, pa- yeah, yeah, okay. What, is that the one I'm thinking of? What's, that, what's the plot synopsis to that one again, Philosopher's Stone? Does anybody remember? It, well, it's 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 a Lovecraftian tale in which you know there's a couple researchers looking at the psychiatry and the psychology of a bunch of crazy people, and they slowly realize that the universe is not what it seems, and that there are horrible things out there, and it might be better if you didn't do any of this. Yeah, don't ask. Yeah. Um, well, I, I kind of like Wilson's The Mind Parasites, which was a... That's the one yes. I'm thinking of. The Mind Parasites That's, was a pretty good novel. The rest were kind of too... Uh, philosophical. Yeah, or, or just going off into, you know, whether ACLO letters exist. Yep. And by the way, you know, he, uh, when he, he, he said he found a reference to ACLO letters in this book, which actually exists by some guy named Hitchcock. In yeah. obscure footnote, he made that up. Did he? Now he that can't. we have the internet, we can look up these obscure books. Yeah. Well, he 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 was the first place I ever read about the Voynich manuscript. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's an educational experience, but it's really when I go, it's not it's not easy to read. You know, yeah. when, when you've got when you've got to some real exciting literature. Well, I'm going to. Well, can I just mention a novel which I mentioned before? Yes, please. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, Eleanor Ingram's The Thing from the Lake, published in 1921. The only novel which influenced the Dunwick horror, because Lovecraft did read it. We got, we got, he, did, he mentioned reading it in a letter to Durlitz before he wrote The Dunwick horror. It influenced the Dunwick horror and the final Doc Savage novel where Doc Savage goes to hell. Okay. Uh, I was just going to say that our friend Salome Jones has just edited a book called Haunted Futures. Tomorrow is coming. Aren't you in that book, Pete? I am. I okay. Am. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, Haunted Futures. Tomorrow is coming. Uh, it's available on Kindle. Uh, it apparently has two Lovecraftian stories in it. Sorry? It apparently has two Lovecraftian stories in it. Oh. 
Okay. It, what is by you? No, not by me. All right, you didn't write a Lovecraft. I story. did not write a. I wrote a strict um, horror sci-fi story uh, that Publishers Weekly, I think, called "Feminist Dystopian Fem- Feminism." Well, I've not had a chance to read this book yet, but two things. Uh, I don't know. It looks like a horror sci-fi. Is that yeah. sound about right? Yeah. And the other thing is, I know it's going to be good because Salome is a really good editor. Yeah. So uh, if you're looking for something to read, you might want to check that out. Uh, what are you guys reading? I am reading this, which I am surprisingly pleased with. Redneck Eldritch. Yes. Okay. Um, I picked it up as a lark, but uh, there are some really good stories in here. Okay. Yeah. I'm reading the new issue of Shadows and Tall Trees. Oh, nice. And I'm trying to get to Behold the Void by a guy named Philip Fracasi. Um, Looking looking forward to that. I hear he's a hack. (laughs) That's a lie. That's a scandalous lie. I heard about that guy. He's a little shady, I think. I hear he writes stories about dogs and puppies. The worst thing you can say about Phil is sometimes he doesn't show up. Well, yeah, he shows true. up at that's the, the Necronomicon in August, and he's wearing that Green Lantern hat. I'm going to take him out back in the alley, womp the hell out of him, and steal the hat. Okay, for all of the insults, I'm going to give him another plug. Behold the Void, Philip Fricazzi. He's he's a damn good writer. He's very good. Yeah. I'm reading. Nope. I just got my contributor's copy of Outside. It is an anthology of horror comics. And really? there's stuff in here by Joe Lansdale, by Linda Rucker. I saw the photos of you. Yeah, the big uh, the big event there in Berlin. You, you, yeah. you and Linda finally met. That's great. Yeah. Um, Diamanda Gallus is in this. I'm in a book with Diamanda Gallus. Amazing. Oh my God. Wow. Um, uh, I've, so I've been reading these horror comics. Um, I want that book. It's, it's, there's some great stuff in here. I, I gotta tell you, um, the artwork is stunning. Um, and I got to I think I know where the hell it is. A um, couple of guys here that own a um, bookstore called so is Topics it, is it in Berlin. German? Is it in German? No. But I was lucky enough. Wow. Kimbo Young, my friend, oh, wow. did the artwork for my stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, I love Kim Boo Young. Um, the like the artist that worked with Linda Rucker. I mean, it's just some I just dynamite stuff. Just trying to show some of it. Wow! It's it, it's a really really wonderful book. It's I'm enjoying the hell out of it, and I'm just thrilled to death to be part of it. Can't imagine, you know. Well, I really got lucky, but you know, everything is different. There's all kinds of, you know, but it's all weird horror, and it's great. Well, Paula Grant, who I believe we all know or know of, um, edited yeah, a book to get it. not too far, uh, not too far in the past, called Halloween Magic Mystery and the Macabre. All right, so, yeah, I actually bought this. The reason why I bring this up is I bought this maybe a year ago. Oh, no, she sent it to me. It's great. Uh, Maybe close to a year ago. All right, so I was looking for another autumnal book the other day, and then I found I didn't know that there was another book that she edited with the title of Halloween. So this one that she's – I had to make sure that they weren't the same books at first. So the one with the subtitle, History of the Macabre, has stories by Laird Barron, Caitlin Kiernan, uh, 
Maria V. Snyder and, and so on and so forth, Norman Partridge. Um, and the one that she edited previously has stories by Joe R. Lansdell, Thomas Ligotti, Charles DeLint. Uh, it's, got an, it's got Lovecraft's Halloween in the Suburb in there, Stuart Onan, Peter Straub. And so if you're into fall, autumn, Halloween like I am, you might want to consider picking up these two books edited by Paula Grand. So I don't know, just Google are, Halloween are, are, and Paula Grand and you'll probably find them. Are they, are they, is that original fiction or are they reprints? Uh, I'm pretty sure they're reprints. So, um, but you know, if you're looking for that theme, they're all gathered into together into one place. So, uh, all right. Did, did she do one of those books with Lisa Morton? I don't know. Off the top of my head. Oh, okay. I don't think so. Not, oh, okay. I don't, the name's not on there, if that's what you mean. Yeah, okay. Lisa no, Morton I didn't know it. and Ellen Datlow have a, 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 an anthology coming out this year in October. Lisa Morton and Ellen Datlow. It's called Haunted Nights. Okay. And it centers around uh, uh, legends and uh, stories of Halloween. Yeah, oh, Lisa's like the the authority on Halloween. She's she's fabulous. Mm -hmm. um, all right. Any other books that anybody wants to plug real quick before we move on? Yeah, I'm reading. I just picked this up. It's called Mus Mutants, Mystics, and the Paranormal. It's an examination of science fiction, superheroes, comics, and the paranormal. And uh, so far, it's a lot of fun. Um, a lot of fun. Okay. Can that's I plug up? That's nonfiction. Non yeah, I read nonfiction. No, I'm, I'm just I'm just clarifying for the listeners. It has some yeah, great reproduction of of classic pages. From comic books, mostly Marvel. Um, uh, Pete, yes. So yeah, right now I uh, there's a Kickstarter going on for a new gob Golden Goblin book between Twilight and Dawn. It's uh, stories that start at sunset and end before sunrise. Um, mm -hmm. The Golden Goblin fiction books have normally come out as stretch goals or long goals for their mythos campaign books but this is the first time they're doing one um as a as standalone and those have been real quality documents so okay Take a, and you're in that Pete. i am right? i am in that and i am the final stretch goal oh uh, well it was a secret <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, we're promoting it. We're promoting it. I'm a yeah. stretch goal, you know. Yeah, they're about because I'm the weirdo who wrote a like ten thousand word novella. Yeah, they're at sixty three hundred dollars right now. They're about halfway there. They need another. They got twenty four days. They'll make it, but I think it's a quality project. Anybody watching American Gods? Yes. Yeah. Yes, um, so far it's a slow burn because they're not wanting to like, uh, you know, shoot all their guns all at once. But it is really well done. Um, if you like the Neil Gaiman book, um, which is, I don't really want to do any spoilers, but uh, heavily leans towards uh, Norse mythology among other created mythologies. But then for the because the series they wanted to do more, he wrote another book called Anansi Boys. It's not as well known, but it was about uh, the Anansi, the trickster spider god from Africa. And then they wrote some more new material for this. So it's sort of a, a, an expansion of American gods with a lot of material from Anansi Boys thrown in. I, the acting has been fabulous. And it's just super weird at this point. If you've not read the book, you, you'll have no idea what's going on. I think it's very well done. I've, I've tried to get into the book several times, and I like Neil Gaiman. 
but I never could get into the book. I do have an idea of what's going on, even though I have not read the book, but uh, I am enjoying it. Um, I think there's just a little bit too much. I don't mind a slow burn. I think there is a, uh, let me preface this by again saying I am enjoying it, but I do think there is a little bit too much of the uh, ocean blood sprays and, you know, artistic things like that, uh, that it, it, it feels stretched. When you do things like that, it feels over and over at least. It feels stretched just for the, you want to make it longer, <laughs> you know. What were you going to say, Ben? Um, I was just going to say, in the in the book, there are little um, interludes, like little uh, side stories, I guess you could say. And in the show, they're just kind of integrating them directly, which feels... Um, it's like it's hard to understand why, you know, there's a scene with the um, the gentleman and, and uh, you know, he's sleeping with the, the goddess. And in the book, that's kind of like this separate thing. But in the show, it's just a random scene in there. Uh, other than that, though, the casting's fantastic. Um, the guy they have playing Shadow Moon is great. Um, Ian McShane's wonderful as Odin. Ian McShane's really wonderful in everything. I don't know. I saw that King's show a few years ago. I, I don't want to give him too much credit, but he's oh. great. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't see that. So everything I've seen him in, I thought he, I thought he was great. Look, everybody <laughs> has their Jaws 3. I avoided that because I love Ian McShane. So out of loyalty. I avoided that one. Is that the one that had, was the modern David and Goliath? Sort of, yeah. It was It was pretty strange. Yeah. But I will go on record. If anybody says anything bad about Deadwood, they're dead. <laughs> That's the danger of uh, certain things you don't raise with Joe. Don't criticize Deadwood and don't praise Dorlis' conception of the king in yellow. Yeah, please. Yeah. Well, <laughs> That's fine, but do that at your own house on your own time. I, I guess for uh, for American Gods, it has to be your mileage may vary. It's worth a look, for sure. I mean, I'm not going to panic. No, I agree. I'm enjoying it. Um, I, I am enjoying it. It's not so. like season two of True Detective, where I can tell you truthfully, avoid like the plague. You know, this one I'm enjoying. One thing I'll say you know, about American Gods. Well, one of the problems with the second season of True Detective was I personally really enjoyed the first season and I was hoping that, you know, hey, we had this auspicious start. Maybe, maybe, maybe you know, we can do something good again, um, which was not the case. Ben, what were you going to say? Yeah. I was going to say one thing about American Gods is it looks like they're doing what they did, um, what they've done with Game of Thrones, where uh, Neil Gaiman said they're only going to go through about the first half of the book, um, the first season. So I'm a little concerned how much they're going to stretch things out because it's not that long of a book. Yeah, now then, then they're really stretching things out. Well, well, that's why they're 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 including material from Anansi Boys. So I'm expecting them to sidestep in a minute and go off to this other material. So it may be I'm really better. enjoying it. I just want them to get to the point. If you watched Happ and Leonard, uh, the season was only, it's like a, one of those little British shows where it's like six episodes. And it was so tight. Uh, it was really wonderful. There was nothing that was excess. It was uh, very lean and well, well thought out and well plotted. And this, uh, I could see where you say, well, maybe they're just going to have too much bloat. But I'm um, well, on the subject of TV, and this will be a short conversation because I think it's probably just me and Rick, but Rick, are you uh, enjoying American Gods, or not American Gods, Doctor Who so far? Yeah, so far. Have you been watching the show after it class? Uh, no, I was wondering if I should or not. It's sort of a Doctor Who version of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And they make that reference. They, and they acknowledge oh, okay. the source material. Well, I have to check it out because I'm a big Buffy fan. Instead of a wormhole, you got a crack in uh, space and time. Um, creatures come out. I'm I'm a little concerned about the season of Doctor Who because it's it seems to be built around the idea of of, of what's in the box. Yeah. I'm a little concerned about the season of Doctor Who because I'm just underwhelmed by it. So far. 
usually I can't wait to watch an episode coming up and I've not seen the latest episode yet. And I'm thinking, I want to get to it. I get to it. It's getting a little predictable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, now as to why that is, I, I, I think, well, I guess it always boils down to the writing for the most part. Yeah, I, I think, I think the first episode was great, but, uh, I want to see the Cybermen. Yeah, sort of. The master or something at this point. Well, so the problem I had with the first episode is that I was wondering if it linked back to two previous episodes that dealt with weird spaceships that we didn't know what happened. Mm -hmm. um, but I also felt like the villain was overpowered. I mean, to be able to travel through time and space when you're just fuel? Yeah, no kidding. I mean, that's that's kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah. I, I can honestly say there's not one single episode, and I say this as a huge Doctor Who fan, uh, there's not been one single episode this season that I thought was stellar. Well, we're only three episodes in, but yeah. Yeah, understood. Well, uh, we're, we're, we're four, actually, but I, I, I would agree with that. I mean, it's like good special effects, but I've seen an, an episode of Doctor Who like this before. Yeah. Every every, every one of them. So, so the other show is called First Class, is that right? Just Class. Just Class. Just Class. Okay. Um, I was, I'm glad you guys... Gave me the recommendation because I was wondering if I should check it out or not, and now I will. In fact, I'm liking class more than Doctor Who at this point because I'm getting into the characters. Okay. I like the guy. I like the guy who's the soccer player. All right. No. Um. All right. So there is a book. It's I've got it right here, called Winter Tide by. I hope I'm saying her last name correctly. Um, Winter Tide by Ruthanna Emrys. And it's a Lovecraftian book. Um, I don't know, Pete, how would you describe this book? What What's a good quick synopsis of this book? Oh, you, you're going to put me on a spot because I... I, I no, I, I don't have to. It's... <sighs> It is, I, I've not read it, and you've not read it. I, I was considering well, reading it. I this came short, across this NPR article and so yeah, on. Yeah, it builds on a short story that the author wrote um, that essentially... The of Earth. Go ahead. The Litany of Earth. Right. Yes. It essentially builds on the idea that uh, the Deep Ones were maligned and that they were broken up and shipped into concentration camps, which that's what's in the story. Um, and that they were unjustly maligned and, and they were, they deserve some more respect and a, a rethink. Well, I, I think it's in the line of those. There used to be a series of novels that Fred Saberhagen wrote more humorously where the Frankenstein monster and the Dracula were really good guys who were maligned. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, but here's, Go ahead, man. I have so much. I, I have heartburn with this because the deep ones. There's a quote straight out of Lovecraft. It's like that the deep ones wanted human sacrifice. You know, and I'm sure none of us are really too sad that the Aztec religion was crushed. You know, with all I the know. human sacrifice that it involved, and it's like you take that away, and suddenly. Mm -hmm. The, the example is the Japanese being interned in World War II, which was terrible. Okay, but then these aren't deep ones anymore. You know, you've taken these Lovecraftian names and you've basically, um, you've subverted it. It's like, they are not the Lovecraftian monsters anymore, so why call them deep ones? Well, let me ask you this. You, did you read The Litany of Earth, Matt? I did. I've not. I've got the other one. It's like. When so Pete, are you saying said, that in her version? Had, of... when, when Pete said he had thirty books in his two B red stacks, like <laughs> my stacks have stacks. Are it's you like, saying that in the in her version of events they didn't? No, commit no they, human they, sacrifice? They, they, were, they were more like um, they were not evil. They were just 
uh, different. They were they had an they had an in touch with nature quality that humans couldn't. They could do sea magic that humans couldn't. And then some. All right. Well, that's there's two separate criticisms there because if that's the case, then then what you're saying, you're absolutely right. They're not really Lovecraftian monsters anymore. They're just another culture. Uh, right. But the whole the whole up. reason, yeah, the whole reason why the government what deep bombed Innsmouth was not because they were another culture. In this, it was because they were. Let's face it, evil. They were a murderous, destructive cult. Uh, okay. Well, let's cult just, okay. In in uh, New Zealand, they're yeah. the Maori. Okay. When the Maori came to New Zealand, when the original ancestors, there were these birds that like had over a ten foot wingspan, and they would fly down and bite the heads off of things. The moa. Yeah, and they it's like they were not evil birds, but they would bite your head off if you were walking around. So they got hunted to extinction because yeah. people weren't worried about like biodiversity and preserving this life form. They didn't want their kids' heads being bit off. It's like so yeah. you say they're not evil per se, like it's just choice A, choice B. You aren't going to choose the ones that are going to sacrifice humans. Well, there's an article on NPR called Remastering the Mythos Questions for Ruth Anna Emery's. And there's a quote in the second paragraph from Ruth Anna Emery's. And I'll read it. When the story started with the government, talking about the shadow over Innsmouth, of course, I was shocked when the story started with the government raid that sends the frog people, frog monster people to concentration camps. It wasn't that Lovecraft could, himself could write this that it, as much as that for almost 80 years, people had read this story and sympathized with the protagonist who calls down that raid. Why wouldn't you sympathize with the protagonist who calls down this raid? Because the people are there are killing humans okay well it's like okay you say like okay are there any people who address this and say the human tendency to forget to forgive to want to think the best of people and say that the deep ones have been oppressed well i could think immediately of two wonderful stories that do this and it comes back to bite the human in the ass and the first of course is the doom that came to insmith by brian mcnaughton which is magnificent in that you think that this this guy is saying his mother, his grandmother was oppressed and put in a camp because she couldn't do free practice of her religion. And the free practice of her, and you say, well, yeah, it's, it's American, you have free practice of religion. Well, it involved murdering people. Yeah, the free practice of religion stops when you're harming other people. Right. And okay, it's not an alternative. I, murdering people is not an alternate point. What's well, the, the other story, Matthew? Um, Brian Hodge wrote, I think it's called The Same Deep Waters as You. Yeah, he did. Great it, story. So, this book is, this story is so good. It's about this woman who can communicate with creatures other than people and seems to have a really gift, like a horse whisperer, sort of. And they bring her to the place where the deep ones are being held. And she begins to try to communicate with them. They've never really spoken or made any effort to, and I think Barnabas Marsh is even being held there. Never made any attempt to communicate with their captors, and she thinks that they've made a breakthrough. But then, through her efforts, there is a raid, and these things escape, and they draw her with her child to Innsmouth. And the implication is they're going to; she's going to sacrifice her child to the Deep Ones. I mean, it's 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 just to get their song out of her head. You know, and I think that is so wrong. There, I think there's one more. I think Kim Newman did a story where, just as an aside, um, he mentions that Senator Kennedy is is going for uh, a uh, general amnesty for all Innsmouth residents. I, I don't remember. Was he the one who did that? Was that Brian Stableford who did that? It might. I can't remember who did it. I thought I, it was. I new. think it's the one called Innsmouth Heritage by Brian Stableford. That, that might be it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I really like Brian Stapleford. He's he's an uh, intellectuals writer. Yeah. Well, uh, I want to draw a distinction here. The deep ones are fictional, so you know we know. So as far as we're all concerned, they did all these horrible crimes. But it would be different if you were dealing, let's say, with uh, horror at Red Hook, 
which had a real religion, the Yazidi, and made them devil worshippers, which was a common libel. And I tried to write some fiction, which uh, rewrote what actually happened at Red Hook. Because you're dealing with a real religion there, it's being libeled in fiction. The deep ones are totally fictional, so it's canonical yeah. that they're evil. Uh, I guess what I don't understand, and look, I'm not saying that I'm always right. If there's an alternate viewpoint that I'm I'm missing here, somebody please tell me. But when Ruthanna Emery's in the NPR article writes uh, that she was shocked that people sympathized as opposed to the frog people who were murdering humans. I don't get it. Well, all right. So one of the throwaway lines in, in my weird company is the idea that um, Binsmith was a deep one response to what was going on in Dunwich. And mm -hmm. this, you know, this attempt to breed a, a human, a deep one hybrid was to create a group of essentially soldiers that could go up the Miskatonic when the uh, Waitley brothers broke out and possibly put a stop to it. Yeah, I thought that was also very clever, but it, it it didn't gloss over their actions. No, no, and, and because they're still inhuman. The difference being is that, you know, they're still a, a natural part of the world, and if the universe, the universal laws of gravity and physics change, they're just as screwed as, as the humans. That's kind of um, like what Charlie Strauss does in his laundry books. Okay. You, you know, that there, there's, yeah. um, there's ambassadors to the Deep Ones. Right. Uh, who have a similar interest in, like, the world not going to hell in a handbasket. Right. Right. But, 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 you know, but to me, she, she glossed over yeah. the, the reason. The killing. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you're, you're whitewashing the fictional race of evildoers as opposed to uh, rectifying a prejudiced view of people who actually exist. So that's, that's why I don't support what she's doing. Well, there's one thing to to persecute people in whatever way, their town or any other numerous ways, because they're they look different, because they act different. Another thing altogether to go after them because of murder. You know, those are those are two separate things. And I'm you I'm know, just wondering why. You could criticize yeah. Shadow over Rin's mouth as being allegorically racist is that you know we're dealing with a different race and we're deterring them and whatever but that's a whole separate matter sure it is yeah. yeah pete well no i was just thinking that you know there there are similar similar stories throughout the throughout lovecraft's mythos and whether it be the the creatures in the lurking fear which are human or the Delapores and the things they kept in the in the cellars, at the in the rats in the walls. I mean, none of this works really well with any of them because their cannibalism is overt. Or Arthur German, and right? Hickman's model and a lot of things. You know, well, you know, with Arthur German, it's not so bad, and and we can we will talk about Arthur German. Uh, with uh, a few other people at uh, Necronomicon. Yeah, but, I can see it. you do have a point there. You know, to, to try and rehabilitate the deep ones, okay, yeah, let's gloss over this. But there were, you know, it's really hard to do it with anybody else. Um, you can't I, I, gloss over Wilbur Waitley and his brother. No. <laughs> um. Yeah, you just have to ignore a little bit of Lovecraftian history, or, or you know what is canon, mm -hmm. and I'm not sure I can do that. And I just yeah. want to I just want to re-emphasize that this is a response to Emery's interview 
with NPR and not the book because we haven't read absolutely. it. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Just, just, no. just absolutely. I'm mainly, this, is a, this is a response yeah, to what she said about the book. Yeah. yeah. You just took the words right out of my mouth. I'm mainly, mainly responding to what she says in right. the right. article. I haven't read the book and it, it, I have no doubt actually that it's a very entertaining story and that she's a great writer. Yeah, because, it makes, you know, it, it, it we could disagree with it, but still enjoy the book as uh, right. an alternate sure uh, parallel history. Yeah, and, and that would be, you know, that might be an interesting thing to look at in terms of, it's probably a really, really good book. And I've really enjoyed the work of hers that I've read. I just don't know that I can buy the premise. Um, it's like that pastiche that you enjoy about Sherlock Holmes, but it doesn't fit in with the canon, so you're not going to right. enshrine it as... Right, but without, have, but without, have, without, having, without having read it, it's possible that even though you initially don't agree with the premise, she can convince you. I mean, I wrote a book once, and when it was sent to the reviewer, the reviewer read the back cover copy and went, "Oh my God! I'd rather go to the dentist than read." Yo, the uh, Joe, no, no disrespect intended to you, but I don't see how anything she could write in a book would get me to come over to the side of murdering cult members. But we haven't read it. I'm, I'm just saying is no. But what she's doing, she's there was a reviewer who absolutely hated the subject matter of the book. I never read. Oh, I'm not talking about the, it's probably a well written book. Well, we're just one thing. She she isn't justifying murder. She's removing murder from the equation. Yeah. Well, yes, that's true. Except that in her second paragraph, in the second paragraph of this NPR article, she's talking about the original Lovecraft story, yeah, where she doesn't understand. The original understand Lovecraft why story. Uh, I can't see how you can sympathize with it. That is exactly what she's saying in this NPR article. She doesn't understand why people sympathize with the humans for eighty years in regards to this story. That's what I'm talking about, not even her book per se. Right, I get you. You see what the difference? Yeah, and you're right. All right, I got you, I got you. So, all right, so let's move on. Uh, let's all agree that I'm right and move on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, boss, thank that's you, a, boss. That's a, that's a joke. All right, uh, S.P. Muskowski got nominated for a uh, <laughs> Shirley Jackson Award, and so did Yay. Joe Pulver. Yay! Yay! And so did Mike Davis. Mike doesn't like yeah, talking well, about himself, so I'll talk about Mike Davis. <laughs> Mike Sorry. Davis ed Mike Davis edited Autumn Cthulhu, which is nominated for the Shirley Jackson Award for Edit and Anthology. Much deserved. Beautiful yeah. book. And. Yeah. Laird Barron's story in Autumn Cthulhu is nominated for a Shirley Jackson Award as well. Um, nominated just in part for the title alone, which is fantastic. No, I'm kidding. Well, it's, of course, great, it's, one of the, it's one of the greatest titles we've ever seen Andy, from anything. Andy Kaufman, I mean, the, Creeping Through the if, Trees. If there, was, if there was an award for titles, you'd just have to give it to Laird, period. Um, uh, Great story. Delighted. Great story. Hell of a ride. Yeah. Yeah. For SP. I was nominated for Muscadines, a novella published by a Dunham's Manor Press. It and will make your flesh crawl. <laughs> it will. Mm. Um, I will hold this up. Tell me if it's backwards, you guys. Okay. Can it's you not. see that? Nope. Is it? Okay. Very can you see it? Right. It's fun. Okay. That's Dave the cover. And uh, Dave Felton did the cover and uh, illustrations. I have a I have a scratch board um, bit of artwork here that he gave me as a gift, um, as you know, upon uh, publication. And uh, Dave Felton is an incredibly talented artist. He did a beautiful job on this. I was really proud of the book and and pleased to work with him and to work with Jordan Crawl, who runs Dunham's Manor Press. Um, so that's it. Um, I really enjoyed the experience and I'm stunned and very honored to be in a category with some amazingly talented people. So 
and mm -hmm. Dave actually did the alternate cover. He gets around. He did the alternate cover for Autumn Cthulhu. Autumn Cthulhu, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which is a fab, that, great cover too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So Joe, you were nominated for uh, the Madness of Doctor Caligari. The Madness of Doctor Caligari. I'm floored that I was nominated. Yay! Um, honored and privileged, and um, no matter what happens, I want to thank the contributors because the nomination to me is is for them. It. It's for the work that they did. Um, uh, well, these stories wouldn't exist if you hadn't contacted well, all of them. Certainly it was my vision, and I steered the boat. It's, but it's a great they, they rowed the boat. They, they made sure the boat got to its destination. So um, Mike knows this because he just edited Autumn Cthulhu, a magnificent book. Th these, these things... It's it's sort of like being making a film. It, it's a team effort, you know. It's like certainly it was Mike's vision. It was a great idea, great book. But without the contributors, it's just an idea. Um, so, uh, and the other thing is, if you one looks at the Shirley Jackson Award, the entire nomination list this year. From novels to long, you know, long fiction to short fiction, it's just amazing, amazing. Of course, it's the Shirley Jackson Awards. The quality of the work in there. Um, uh, I'm glad I'm not voting. You know, it's like, look at the novels. How do you how do you pick one? You know. Yeah. Well, so. I just want to say thanks to both of you. Um, you know, it's. I was thrilled to have a story in Autumn Cthulhu and uh, Madness of Dr. Caligari. I think they're great books, and I hope that this will give them a, an even bigger boost. They've done well, but I hope that the uh, award nominations will give them an even bigger boost because everyone should. If you like, if you like short fiction, if you like really well written stories, powerful stories, you should buy these anthologies and read them. Um, whether you're into weird fiction or not, I mean, if you like weird fiction, then, you know, bonus. But uh, these are these are really, really fine anthologies. You guys should be very proud. Well, thanks, SP. And, and I also I also want to, again, but publicly thank Mike for the privilege of being in Autumn Cthulhu. Um, I think it's a really Thanks. great book. Um, and I don't see this as competition. Nothing made me happier than to see Mike's name on that list. Um, did a great, great, fantastic job as far as I'm concerned. Now, Thanks, you up. too. Thanks, bro. <laughs> One thing I'd like to mention, um, also up for uh, an award, is uh, The Ballad of Black Tom by Victor Lavelle. Oh, yeah. Um, yes. Which yeah. is really, sure. I mean, it's probably the best piece of weird fiction I've read in years. It's, um, uh, I don't think this book could get talked about enough. And even sort of touches on the point you guys were making about the shadow over Inn's mouth and looking at the other side. Um, this book really takes one of Lovecraft's, I would, I would honestly say it's one of his worst stories. It's just not even well written and makes it just amazing. So if, if anyone hasn't read it, I'd rush out there and get the, uh, yeah. I think it's only like three or $4 on the Kindle. Which okay. story? Time, uh, the Dream Quest of Velvet Bow is on there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dreamland That's story. On there. Well, again, again, like I just said, that the, every category, it's like, wow. Yeah. This, is, this is really a, a, a banner year for nominations as far as the quality of the work. Um, but I think every year, uh, any uh, yeah, year, I, no matter I, who's, yeah. you could take the Shirley Jackson Award nomination list and just work your way through that whole list, and there are no duds. There are no duds. No. It's really exciting. So yeah, you may you may find something where the subject matter isn't to your taste, but as far as the quality of the work, yeah, the yeah. quality of the work is is there. Um, yeah. Like I said, I think I consider it an honor and a privilege just to 
being nominated. It is, and you get a rock. No matter what happens, you get a rock. You get another rock, Joe. You do? Yeah. You, you get, get a, a rock. They give you a rock, baby. and uh, rock. it's, it's to me, engraved. This is the green jacket at Augusta. <laughs> I love rock. Yeah. No, I got a rock. One, All nominees get a rock. I'm building yep. a collection of rocks. <laughs> you can build a stone altar around you. Can. You are? How many Shirley yeah. Jackson nominations do you have? <laughs> Who? Who, me? You. You're building a collection of rocks, you said. Oh, this will be my third. This will be my wow. third one. But, yeah. That's yeah, awesome. I love that rock. That rock means a lot to me. Oh, man, that rock. <laughs> it's hilarious. And it's a wonderful idea. Well, you that's sit awesome. there and you go, all I want is to get a rock. <laughs> just the rock. You mean the Are we rock. happy? Please rock. Yeah. Just the I look at the, Yeah, Rick. Just a question for Ben. What's Lovecraft story did Black Tom tie into? Uh the horror at Red Hook. It's um oh, Okay, then I, then I would definitely want to read it. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's uh I it it sort of veers away from it a bit, so you, you don't get like an exact adaptation from the other side, but it's um it's a million times better than the horror at Red Hook. It's really brilliant. It's, uh, uh, and, and, I have, and, and I have not heard anything other than the highest praise for this book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. This is the first res uh, quote unquote response to the racism of H.P. Lovecraft that um, I've ever read that I felt really understood elements and kind of how the racism that we all acknowledge H.P. Lovecraft had, but actually influenced his understanding of horror. This does a great job of kind of taking those tropes, but showing you from the other side. It's, it's really amazing. Um, next week on the podcast, we'll have a guy by the name of Soren Narnia, S-O-R-E-N. Narnia, that's a, uh, let's say, it's a, that's a pen name, let's say. Um, and he... he author of the knife point horror podcast and i really recommend this this horror podcast there are a hell of a lot of horror podcasts out there um but with this one start at the beginning knife point horror and work your way forward the, these are some really creepy scary stories they're really well done this guy's got a lot of talent hmm. so we'll talk with him next week uh let's give away our prize matt what do you have again Okay. Speaking of Shirley Jackson Award nominations, this is the hardcover copy uh, of The Madness of Dr. Caligari. Beautiful book, great stories. Harry O'Morris cover. Yes, it's gorgeous. All right, if you wanna if you wanna be in the be put in the random drawing for that, uh, send me an email to Lovecraft Easy and Prizes. And I'll choose a winner seven or eight days from now. I usually do it seven Sundays or Mondays for the week before. So uh, Lovecraft easing prizes at gmail.com and put the mad madness of Dr. Caligari in the in the subject of the email. So all right. Well, thanks everybody for watching and listening, and we'll see you next week.